Thank you very much, my dear brother, for praying for us and for reading the scripture this morning, for the announcements as well. Because we just prayed, I'm going to believe that the Lord has heard us and we have been uh, surrounded with his presence, with the blessings of his angels as well. So I would like to mention something that I've been collecting just from this morning. There are a lot of things that are happening in this world. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because if you haven't noticed, tomorrow is October 22nd. Did you realize that? That's a big deal, right? Well, go back 173 years and you're in 1844. What was happening at this time 173 years ago was that people all over the world were agitated about the coming of Jesus Christ, right? It was very big news that Jesus was coming soon. And since learning about who God is, and especially when coming out publicly with it and starting to interact with people in the world, literally all over the world, I can only conclude that what was happening 173 years ago is happening again today. And we're not calling people to that specific portion of the prophecy, which is Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, the hour of his judgment is come, based on Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, which is saying, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We're not bringing people to that focus of the first angel's message. Now we're talking about that same first angel's message, but our focus is worship God or fear God and give glory to him. And so it's really exciting that the first angel's message, again, is stirring up this kind of agitation around the world. So I feel a little bit like being part of what was happening 173 years ago. And I'm excited about that. I really believe God is doing it again. And so I've I've put together, just this morning I was thinking about it, in Canada, just a short time ago, there were 30 people that decided, you know what, God is not who we've been told he is. Let's start studying together. And this group, now together for about four months, to my understanding, is 30 strong. I've been interacting with them a little bit. There's a pastor in Romania who doesn't know what to do. He believes this. He knows his church and his conference doesn't. And so he's trying to figure out what's going on. I just talked to him via, um, what do you call it, FaceTime, messenger, not just typing back and forth, but we were able to interact. Um, In South Africa, there's a pastor who has already met with his conference. They have responded saying, you cannot teach this until we're done with our interactions with you. And in Argentina, as you heard earlier, there's a group of about 20 or so Four people were baptized just this last week, as far as I understand. There's a group in Texas that has just come together in the last couple of months. I'll be going out there to be speaking soon. In Florida, they're, they're coming together. They're starting to group, and now they have uh, already donated some funds to where I've, I'm able to go and fellowship with them. Um, let me think now. Florida will be in March. And there's a group here in California. You can just look around. So there's, there's a group in Iowa that have been just coming together. Several families contacted me just yesterday. Hey, can you come out here and worship with us? We'd love to have a, a meeting together. There's a group in Wisconsin that wants to meet. We're going to be uh, video Skyping or communicating through a program called Zoom next week on Sunday. And there's a group of them that want to be able to do something with us, hopefully, to be able to spread the truth about health. Now, there's another place somewhere in this world, I'm not going to tell you where, but James and White used to live, James and Ellen White used to live there. Just this morning, there was, a, there was a negative spiritual fire that broke out in the church because of who these people believe in. They believe in the one true God. And the group around them didn't like it. So I was just sent a message this morning like, hey, help me out. Pray for us. Several pastors that I will not talk about are not speaking out yet. I know five of them so far that are here no, not all of them, but most of them are here in this, na- this nation, America. Um, somebody sent me this this morning. We met at Roan Mountain Camp Meeting. I've been studying the truth about God for 15 years, and I'm so excited that just in the last few years, God is moving in an incredible way. Amen. This guy's been around in this message for 15 years. Wow. And they said, just in the last couple, this is starting to swell. You like that word swell? 
The swelling of the loud cry, right? Fear God and give glory to Him. This is what it's about. Okay, so um, the reason why I'm presenting today what I'm presenting is because I believe that we are right now living in the time of, how would you say, um, the latter rain beginning to fall. I, I sense that what was happening 173 years ago is happening again. And if you don't mind, just for a moment, I'm going to check my preferences and I'm going to schedule my battery power to turn off later. That way we don't have to worry about this going dark. So the reason why I'm presenting this is because there was a young man. I've seen him. We've not spoken together, but we've interacted via messenger on Facebook. And what has happened is he mentioned to me that um, through an email once, you know, I've got some questions. If you don't mind going through this document, I would really appreciate it. The document was entitled Questions for Anti-Trinitarians of Goodwill. I thought, okay, this is good. So I, I said, give me some time. I'm really excited. I want to go through these and I will answer you. And then I told him the history about how I had put up 50 hard questions about the Trinity a while back. And I got a ton of comments on Facebook. But only one person out of all the people that said they would try to answer, only one person actually sent answers. And so I felt like, what an opportunity. Somebody is, is doing the same thing to me. And so this person, his name is um, Alessio Rando. He told me I could use his name. He said, that's fine. Alessio, if I'm saying it right, is that the right way to say that? Alessio? You familiar with the name? Eliseo. 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 Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to know that. Eliseo. So he told me I could go ahead and uh, use his name. But So what happens is I put the notes that I had come up with in response to his questions in a PDF. I sent them to him. I didn't hear back for a while. And he said, now, wait a minute, what about this? And I was like, no, okay, he's studying now. So I responded, well, what about this? I responded, what about this and this? And I responded to those. Just giving Bible scriptures, giving the spirit of prophecy text, and emphasizing and highlighting the things that make sense to me. So he wrote back, just this week, I asked him, would you please write something that will give a bit of your testimony, having received the responses to this? And this is what he said, I got it last night. Happy Sabbath. Some time ago, I asked Brother Mesa to answer some of my questions about the Trinity and the inspired writings. I wrote 20 questions explaining with them some Bible and Spirit of Prophecy quotations. I asked him to answer them in order to understand some quotations and to understand also the point of view of the non-Trinitarian movement within the STA Church. After some days, Brother Mesa answered my questions with other quotations that pushed me to study more deeply the topic about the Trinity and to consider also the points of the non-Trinitarian movement. I'm still studying, yet some of your points are strong. But your answers have helped me to open my mind also to another point of view and to not consider true a doctrine only because it's supported by the majority. In Christ, Alessio. Amen. Yeah, amen. I thought that was great. Good stuff. So what we're going to do then is I'm going to put his questions and the answers that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy have. I'm going to present them to you today, okay, in two parts, because I don't want Eutychus to fall out of the window. <laughs> we would be here too long. So here's the first question. If God is composed only by the Father and the Son, if the Godhead is composed only by the Father and the Son, only two persons, why the Lord Jesus commanded to baptize in the name of three persons. And you'll see that I'm going to just read how he wrote it, though sometimes I might correct it just because uh, he speaks a different language. It's not, English is not his first language. And one of the scriptures that he puts in red says this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, verse 19. Good question, right? Well, the first premise, I think, is a false premise. He asked the question, if the Godhead is composed only by the Father and the Son. So, is the Godhead composed of the Father and the Son? Yes. Or, is the Father the fullness of the Godhead? Yes. 
and is the Son the fullness of the Godhead? You don't need both of them together to make the fullness of the Godhead. They, they each have the fullness of the Godhead. So the premise is a little bit skewed. So the Godhead doesn't equal a composition of Father and the Son. But rather, the Father is all the fullness of the Godhead, the Son is all the fullness of the Godhead, and the Spirit is in all the fullness of the Godhead. Consider Colossians 1 verse 19. It says, It pleased the Father that in Him, that would be Christ, should all fullness dwell. Right? So it was the Father's pleasure that in his Son all the fullness would dwell. Now, what if it wasn't the Father's pleasure? Would it have happened? No. See, if you just ask that simple question, you realize, wow, it was God's will, God's pleasure, God's desire that in his Son all the fullness would dwell. So now, when he's quoting Matthew 28, verse 19, and it says, baptizing in the name, the word is name, not names. That's very important for me to understand in this context, because... Name most everywhere else represents what? Character, right? So why not here? What if we're to baptize in the character of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? How was that character revealed to us? By the Son. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's referring directly to the character of the Father. Certainly he couldn't reflect the outward appearance of the Father because Jesus Christ became flesh. Had the Father ever become flesh? No. So the Father's name is not Father. That's so important to understand. That's, that's a title of his in the position that he has in the family of God. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's the title for his position. The Son's name is not Son. It is the title for his position in the family of God. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have the name Holy, Sp Holy Ghost. That's what it is. It's holy and it's a ghost or a spirit. So it doesn't really have the name Holy Ghost. So we're not given the names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What we are given is that we're to be baptized in the name or character of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That makes much better sense to me. Amen. So your conclusion would have to be that we should use titles or names for the three when only one name is required by the actual statement of Jesus. Okay? Also, please show me a single time when somebody is baptized in the way, in that way, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, in the Bible. The New Testament gives only examples of being baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, I didn't realize that as a Trinitarian. I only realized that after I studied who God is. And then somebody challenged me on baptism, and so I went and I looked up what the New Testament says about baptism, because there's not a whole lot in the Old Testament about baptism. And I found every single time consistently that baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ. And Romans chapter 4 says very clearly that when you're baptized, you're baptized into the what of Christ? The death of Christ. Did God the Father die? No. Did the Holy Spirit die? No. no, it was Jesus Christ that died. Okay, So the, the divinity that Christ partook of, it did not die. The Father was in Christ, according to John chapter 14, verse 10, and that divinity did not die. Christ, all of him died. And so if we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into the name of Jesus because he's the one that died for us. That makes a lot of sense to me, whereas the other doesn't seem to. Now, here's the question number two. If the Holy Spirit isn't a divine person, and I think what he would mean is being, by the way he was asking the questions later, why did Jesus and the apostles place him on the same level of the, as the Father and the Son? And again, it quotes Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Matthew 28, 19. And then he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So now, here is my answer in blue. This is not on the same level. That is a human construct. Even Jesus said, my Father is greater than I. So were they on the same level according to Jesus? No, so to put them all on the same level is not something we have in the Bible. This is being baptized into the family of God, the Father, the Son, and their spirit. 
Notice John chapter 14, verse 23. If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him and make our abode with him. So, do you know what grace is? I asked Alessio. They must have his grace. What is his grace according to the next words? The Spirit of Christ to help their infirmities, or they cannot resist evil. Steps to Christ, page 52.2. If you cannot resist evil without the Spirit of Christ or grace, then that quote in Desire of Ages, page 671, the second paragraph, makes perfect sense. You can only overcome sin by the power of the third person of the Godhead, which comes in no modified energy. It's the Spirit of Christ that was given when you finish that, that paragraph. So grace is the communion of the Holy Spirit. Whose spirit? The same one that was in the prophets. The prophets were, quote, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, verse 11. And now we're going to notice something later about that verse that um, just really stuck out to me when I was answering these questions. Here's, here's question number three. And by the way, if any of you have questions while I'm answering, please feel free so that, that maybe I'm missing something and you can you know, uh, bring in a comment or there could be a little more clarification to either myself or to you. I'd be happy for that. Number three, if the Holy Spirit is only the Spirit of God and or of Christ, how could he be the, quote, another comforter promised by our Savior? And here's the scripture he gives, John chapter 14, verse 16. I will pray, you the, I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Jesus, just after he said that, the very next words was, even the spirit of truth. That would be John chapter 14, verse 17. Now, he had already said in verse 6 of that same chapter that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Did he not say that? Yes. So when he says, even the spirit of truth, you'd have to conclude, okay, he just told us that he is the truth. It's the spirit of truth. Who would that be? Christ, Christ his spirit. So when it's the, another comforter, it's the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth was dwelling with them and would be in them, according to verse 17. Then notice what Jesus said in verse 18. Then Christ says, I will come to you. He said, I will not leave you fatherless. I will come to you. So I'm going to pray the Father. He will send you another comforter. The word another, by the way, and we can thank, um, I won't mention, but somebody popular for the comment about this word alos. The word alos is uh, exactly identical to the one that was sent the first time. Okay, if you want some more water, you're going to get some more of the exact water that you just drank. And so Christ is saying, the Father is going to send another of the identical comforter. Amen. And so when Jesus is mentioning this comforter, he's actually speaking of himself because he said, it's going to be the spirit of truth and I'm the truth. The, this spirit is dwelling with you now and will later be in you. And then he says, I will not leave you fatherless or orphans or comfortless. I will come to you. And so you put those verses together, there is no way you can see that it's anything other than Jesus Christ. So then, also, did you know that Jesus called his message here a parable? That's interesting. You can notice in John chapter 16, verse 25, then these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. The word Proverbs could be parable in the New Testament. You can see it in the Greek. It only happens in five times in the New Testament. So now, what things was he talking about? As there in the verse, these things have I spoken unto you in parable. Not thing, this thing, it's things, plural. What things was it? Was it about the comforter, the vine, and the laboring woman? I think yes. We can say each of those is somewhat parabolic. Now, the comforter, we understand, is a mystery. Paul said it in first, uh, rather the first chapter of Colossians, verse 27, where he says, it's the mystery that needs to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. Not that's to be hidden forever. It's a mystery that needs to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Now, have you noticed or looked at the five times the New Testament uses the specific word for comforter? Okay, parakletos. 
What about the last time when John, the same author as the first four times it's used, gives it a name? Gives it a name. And I say it because that's, there's, that's biblical. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have a parakletos. We have a comforter. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. That's the identical word. Which is fascinating because what you're looking at there is John is saying, we need a comforter. Christ is going to send a comforter. If Christ doesn't go away into heaven, he's not going to be able to send the comforter. That's what John was remembering Jesus was saying. And John used that same specific word, comforter, one more time. It was in a letter. And he says, listen, guys, don't be discouraged. If we sin, I don't want you to. But if you do, that comforter, remember that I told you about in previous letter? That comforter is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. 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 So the word advocate is the same identical word as comforter used by the same author. That is so important to understand. You know, if it was used by somebody else like Peter, okay, maybe Peter had a different understanding of the word, but it wasn't Peter. It was John. So now while Jesus ministers, oh, by the way, this is a quote from the Desire of Ages, page 166.2. Very important to understand this one. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still, still by his spirit, the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense. That means you can't really see him. But his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you, how long? Always, even unto the end of the world. Wait a minute, Jesus. How are you going to be with us even unto the end of the world while you're in heaven? I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Amen. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. This is the third angel's message. Remember, the com- keeping the commandments of God through the faith of his son. How? Through his spirit. Amen. Amen. So, he is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 20. While he, that's Christ, delegates his power, first, I mean, the first chapter of uh, the book of Acts, and also the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, I think it is, you can see that the word power is equated with the spirit, according to the Bible. While he delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence is still with his church. The fourth question. If the Holy Spirit is not a person, I would say being, he probably means being, but I'll just give him the, you know. How could he be blasphemed? Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, he quotes in a verse, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Matthew 12, verse 32. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. From Mark 3, 29. Those are, these are strong words. Thank you for saying that. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a being But it is a person. It is the grammatical third person of either the Father or the Son. But the Spirit comes to us from the Son, as there is only one mediator between God and men, the what? The man, Christ Jesus. That's in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. See, we don't have a mediator in the Holy Spirit. We don't have somebody who, can, who is a go-between between between us and the Father and the Son if we hadn't had Jesus Christ becoming a man. Amen. Jesus Christ became a man. It's important to understand that God cannot be tempted with evil. And so in order for God to be tempted with evil, the Son of God was made into a person. Okay, remember Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 says, A body hast thou prepared me. He didn't have a body before. He was a spirit, just as his father. A body hast thou prepared me. Why? So that he could be tempted as a man. So that he could die. Because if he wasn't in the body of a human, he couldn't have died. It is imperative that Christ became a human. 
And so there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so, yes, he, the Spirit is a person. He's the grammatical third person of the Father or the Son, but comes to us through the Son. There's never a mention of the first person of the Godhead in all of Ellen White's writings. There's never, ooh, that actually jumped way out of place. But by the way, just so you would like to see it, it's in the Desire of Ages, page 671. You can see that right at the top there. And if you go down in the original, which I actually have, I have a 1898 version of the Desire of Ages, and it says on page 671, sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Notice the word Godhead is uh, capitalized. Third person is not capitalized. So Ellen White's intention was never to make the third person in title case, something that should be noted as a being that has an actual title as third person. So we're just talking about the third person of the Godhead. And so to use what Ellen White originally wrote, compared to what's written now, because if you go to the digital books of Desire of Ages, and if you go to the books that have been published recently, the word third person is capitalized. But that is not how it was done in the original. Does that make sense? Yes. Some things have been changed, and it, it's actually, it helped me for many years, even as a pastor for many years, to understand that the third person was a being that was God. I used to believe that the Holy Spirit was God. There was three gods, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that anymore. There's one God. It's the Father. He has a Son, Jesus Christ, and they have given their spirit. Amen. So now... There is never a mention of the first person of the Godhead. There's never a mention of the second person of the Godhead. There is only a mention of the third person of the Godhead. And that being not title case, but lower case. Does that make sense? Yes. So now, I've done this series, but I just want to cap it real quick. The prophets used the phrase Son of Man 88 times in the New Testament. 84 of those 88 times, every one of those 84 was in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nearly every one of those times, it is Jesus speaking of himself, speaking in the what? Third person. Third person. And he called himself he, and he called himself him. Now also in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Jesus speaks of himself in the third person as the shepherd. I didn't write this down, like actually paste it. So why don't we take our Bibles and we'll look at that together. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. This one's really important to understand. So if you wouldn't mind opening your Bible to go to this one, it'd be very helpful. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. It says there in verse 1 of John 10, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. Notice verse 2 of John chapter 10. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, who would contend that the shepherd of the sheep is Jesus Christ? It's Jesus, right? Notice verse 3. To him, that would be the shepherd, the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. Is that Jesus speaking of himself in the third person using he, him, and his? Yes. Why would it be so strange for him to do it just a couple of chapters later when he's talking about the comforter? Right? So I think that is a really strong argument there. Now the entire Jewish nation blasphemed the Holy Spirit when they rejected the spirit of truth, which was Jesus, which proceeded from the Father. John chapter 15 verse 26. So now, you could ask the question, how is the Holy Spirit not called a person if he can be blasphemed? The Holy Spirit is a person. It's the third person of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ here personally, as it says in John chapter 14, verse 17, the Spirit is with you now and shall be in you. When that Spirit of truth was blasphemed, they were blaspheming who? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Does that make sense? The grammatical third person. Now, what constant... This is from the fifth volume of the Testimonies, by the way, 634. It says, what constitutes the sin against the Holy Ghost? It is willfully 
attributing to Satan the work of the Holy Spirit. And do you know that I am studying the Bible and I have been told that what I'm doing and my conclusions are a direct work of Satan? If they could show that from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, I'd be willing to listen. But I'm, I'm telling you, this stuff is making so much sense to me these days that I am only rejoicing that I'm on God's track. Amen. Amen. There is that line of truth that I want to follow, and I feel like my feet are on it, and I'm excited about it. Amen. Now, I'd like to give you a little bit of homework. We're not done yet because I want to get through 10 questions. But I, I don't want to forget this. You have a responsibility... You can do this because tomorrow is October 22nd. There is a book out there that if you don't have, you need to get it today and we can help you. It's called The Great Controversy. You can also find it online. But if you read chapter 20 and 21, I believe what that's explaining is what's happening in this world today. Chapter 20 is a, oh, I knew I was gonna forget the title as soon as I brought it up. The chapter is 20. And it is called a, an awakening, something, a great awakening. I think it's called the great awakening. And then chapter 21 is the warning rejected. Okay. I want you to read those chapters for tomorrow. The reason why it's tomorrow is because that's October 22nd. That's 173 years after the whole thing started with the first and the second angel's messages. And of course, that was during the time the second angel's message was being uh, fully brought out, but here's the fifth question. If the Holy Spirit is only a divine influence from God the Father and Jesus Christ, how can he make intercession for the saints helping them how to pray or teaching them how to pray? So one of the verses he quotes is, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Notice what it says there. The Spirit, what's the next word? Itself, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So now here in this, in this next verse, which is 27, this is that, uh, this section here, if you can see my mouse. Um, he that searcheth the hearts, so there's somebody that searches the hearts, that knows what is the mind of the Spirit. That's interesting, isn't it? Somebody who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, did you notice the wording, the Spirit itself? And have you considered verse 34? Notice what it says. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So in verse 26, it's the Spirit that makes intercession. But remember, there's only one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. And so in the next couple of verses, when it says that Jesus Christ is making intercession for us, could it be that the Holy Spirit, not Christ, is making intercession for us? No, because there's only one Spirit. I'm sorry, one mediator. And so it would must be, it would necessitate that it is the Spirit of Christ that is making intercession for us. Does that make better sense? Yes. I think that's what's being said right there in context. So remember, the Desire of Ages 166.2, as quoted in the above question number three. The Spirit of Christ helps us to pray, intercede for us, but you know there's only one mediator, which is Jesus Christ. So that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, which we've already read. Number six, if the Holy Spirit is not a person, how could he testify? And here's the verse. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. Good question. I like that. That's a good question. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 from the NIV. Notice the answer. The Holy Spirit is a person, therefore it can testify. It's the third person of Jesus Christ. Notice this text, one that we've already read before. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified okay wait a minute so up here he's saying how could the holy spirit testify if it's not a person watch what happens though in this verse the spirit of christ it testified 
So whose spirit is testifying? Whose spirit testified to the prophets of the Old Testament? That's what this section is talking about directly. If you look at verse 10, it's talking about the prophets in the Old Testament. They were testifying of the sufferings which would come upon Christ. And so the spirit of Christ is called it, and it is testifying right here in this verse. So question, who or what testified? And was the spirit just called it? Number seven, if the Holy Spirit exists only from Pentecost of AD 31, what quote-unquote Holy Spirit did David ask for that it wouldn't be taken from him? Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, Psalm 51, verse 11. I like Dustin's answer. It's the same spirit. Notice what Ellen White said. Christ determined to bestow a gift on those who had been with him and on those who should believe on him because this was the occasion of his ascension and inauguration, a jubilee in heaven. What gift could Christ bestow rich enough to signalize and grace his ascension to the mediatorial throne? It must be worthy of his greatness and his royalty. Christ gave three things. His representative three things that basically equal the same thing, it's just different ways to say it. His representative, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. This gift could not be excelled. The divine spirit, converting, enlightening, sanctifying, would be his donation. He would give all gifts in one, from manuscript 1898. On the day of Pentecost, Christ gave his disciples the Holy Spirit as their comforter. Amen. Right? So that helps ask, answer the question, how, did, how is it that if Christ gave his spirit at Pentecost? He did, right there. That's, that's writing from the, the hand of inspiration. In uh, 1898, by the way, which is the same year that the book, The Desire of Ages, was published. I wish this whole of the quote would have been included in The Desire of Ages. God the Father is a spirit, according to John 4, verses 23 through 24, the Son was begotten in the express image of his Father. He was begotten in 3.16 and in his express image in Hebrews 1 verse 3. Therefore, the Son would be spirit as well as the Father. So, Christ came to this earth personally in the Old Testament, just as he does in the New Testament, of course, through his spirit. Though Christ came to this earth with the body his Father had prepared for him. So, David received the victorious spirit of Christ just as Adam did. It was by faith in the future coming. This is how they both received the promise of forgiveness as well. Because remember, Christ hadn't died yet. So how could they be forgiven? By lambs? No. no, that's what Hebrews is all about. Christ hadn't been victorious as a human yet. So how could they be victorious? By trying? No. But by faith in the coming Christ. Amen. The same exact way we have victorious faith. Amen. The faith of Christ just like they had the faith of Christ. It all boiled down to everybody coming in by faith into the experience of Jesus Christ here on the earth as the man, Amen. Christ Jesus. Amen. That gives me chills just saying. It's powerful. Number eight, if the Holy Spirit exists only from Pentecost of AD 31. <laughs> okay, yes, it's true, it happened that way, but the Father and the Son are spirit. They've always been as spirit, as long as the Father has been around, which is, as far as I can tell, throughout eternity past. The Son was begotten and brought forth from the Father. He was spirit, so they've existed. But the Spirit of Christ didn't exist until Pentecost. He asks, what Holy Ghost caused Mary to be pregnant, if in fact the Holy Spirit came, you know, AD 31? Luke 1.35 the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, is what is bold in. And then it says, And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. My answer in blue is, It's the part that you didn't notice and highlight in bold. The power of the highest. Amen. Yeah. So the Holy Ghost is the power of the highest. Amen. Well, who's the highest? Father. Remember, even Jesus said, My Father is greater than I. Jesus he didn't know certain things. And I'm going to present this sometime because there's a whole bunch more about this. But he didn't know his coming, for example, in Matthew 24, verse 36. Also, only the Father had foreknowledge, which occurs only four times in the Bible. Acts 2, 23, Romans 8, 29, uh, Romans 11, verse 2, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. 
So Christ said, the Father is greater than I. So Jesus didn't know everything. The Father was greater than him. And certainly there wouldn't have needed to be a council of peace between them both if they both knew everything. Think about that. It'd be kind of awkward. You both are God on the same throne, in the same position, with the same title, and the same everything. But you're separate. And you know everything, so you're just sitting in a council. Why would you need to counsel if you know everything? All right. So obviously somebody had to learn and understand to be able to have counsel. And it was the Father's ultimate will that was decided in concert with his Son. Because God wouldn't force his Son to save humanity, right? So just them being together in the council defeats the fact that Christ could have uh, known everything. And what was the question in regard to this one? Oh yeah, that's right. How could the Holy Ghost uh, cause Mary to be pregnant? Well, it was the power of the highest. That was the whole point of saying all these things. The highest would be who? Jesus or the Father? It was the power of the Father, the power of the highest. And so does Jesus have two fathers? The Father and the Holy Ghost, which is the third being that doesn't have a throne or a crown? No. It was the power of the highest. It's the power of the Father. So Jesus only has one Father. So, question number nine. If the Holy Spirit existed only from Pentecost, what, quote-unquote, Holy Spirit anointed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at his baptism and drove him out into the wilderness? And then he quotes, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, 10 and 12. And then it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Remember, we already know who the power of the highest is or what the power of the highest is. That would be the Father's Spirit. And so I said, well, you asked. Because this is a powerful quote. I love this quote. It's from the youth instructor. Never had angels listened to such a prayer. They were solicitous to bear to Jesus, the praying Redeemer, messages of assurance and love. Because the angels are very much in active uh, duty, constantly going up and down, seeing the Father's face. You can see that in Matthew chapter 18. They were solicitous, the angels were, but no, the Father himself will minister to his Son. Direct from the throne proceeded the light of the glory of God. The heavens were open and the beams of light and glory proceeded therefrom and assumed the form of a dove, in appearance like burnished gold. The dove-like form was emblematical. Say that word with me. Emblematical of the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. That's in Youth Instructor, March 1st, 1874. Not too long before the Desire of Ages was written as well. It's the spirit of the Father. It proceeded from the Father in John 15, 26. Light and glory. And so for today, our last question is, If the Lord Jesus isn't God as the Father, why does the Bible call him God? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Notice there's two things there. A child is born. A son was the one that was given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, verse 6. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bear or bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Matthew 1, verse 23. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now, right here I had to stop and say, wait, I don't read this in the Strong's Concordance when looking. This is a bit of a stretch to me to use another version to state what you wish to convey. So if you look at the uh, King James Version, this verse does not say that. The verse says, the only begotten of God. Okay, you can look it up for yourself in John chapter 1 verse 18 if you have a King James Version. The ESV, I suppose I'd have to look and do some research of where they got that. I know it's from a different source, but they said, the one who... Has ever, no one has ever seen God, the only God 
who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So I thought that was kind of a sneaky trick there. And so I called him out on it. Just uh, I'm going to do some more research on it, but I tend to stick more closely to the King James um, in my studies. And so that's what I've been using. That makes better sense with what the Bible and both the spirit of prophecy is saying. So then in John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas answered and said unto, unto Jesus, My Lord and my God, whose are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Romans 9, verse 5. For in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, verse 9. Without controversy, great was the mystery of godliness. God, I would say the Father, was manifest in the flesh. That's why the, G, the Son in the flesh could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 1 Timothy 3.16. Jesus is God. We can't be, misunderstand that. I fully believe Jesus is God. Somehow people keep saying that we believe that the Spirit is, I should say, not a person, and that Jesus isn't God. Oh, there it is. Saying we don't believe the Spirit is a person and that Jesus is God, or isn't God. But this is not at all what the Bible is saying. Jesus was called God by the Father, and rightly so. Correct? Yes. But the Father never called the Son my God. That is so important to understand. Jesus is God because he is brought forth from the Father. In fact, from the same substance. Just like Eve was brought forth from Adam, the Son was tore from the bosom of the Father. Now, the Father never calls the Son my God. Jesus, on the other hand, said that seven different times regarding his Father. Notice Matthew 27, verse 46. My God, my God. That's two. Why hast thou forsaken me? John 20, verse 17. I ascend unto my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. That's three now. Revelation 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. That's four. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon in the name of my God, that's five, and shall uh, in the name of the city of my God, that's six, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, that's seven, and I will write upon him my new name. And then I said, ask me sometime about Adam and Eve. I didn't want to take the time to explain all that at this point. But what's important is the father never is called, rather, never called his son my God. He did call him God, rightly so. He's our God, but he's not the Father's God. The Father has no God. The Father worships no one. The Father surrenders or submits to no one. I've said for years, even as a Trinitarian, I would say in prayer, God, thank you so much for choosing to be who you are. God is love. But he doesn't have to surrender to anybody. Everything under his authority worships him. The one true God, who we are calling people to worship. Amen. Can we also worship Jesus? The answer is yes. And so I tr truly believe we have a special message for this time in earth's history. Amen. Fear God and give glory to him. Amen. For the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. I want to continue to learn from the Bible and the writings of Ellen White about this God who will send his son to take us again to bring him into eternal glories forever and evermore. What about you? Yes. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able, by your grace, to read some of the quotes, some of the verses from your Bible about who you are and to understand them sometimes in new ways, in deeper ways, in what I consider more consistent ways with the rest of the scripture. So thank you for leading and guiding us. You've promised that you would send another comforter through your son. You've done that. It is the spirit of your son. He is with us today just as much as he was with the disciples, even more, because now as was mentioned by your son, he can be in us. Thank you for this. We want that mind to be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. So I pray that you'd continue to lead and guide us, and thank you for everybody that has been able to study this and come to better conclusions. We do ask you to continue to keep us and guide us, and we thank you in Christ's name.